Good evening, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Roger Crisp, the director of the Hero Oxford Institute, uh, which is not yet one day uh, old. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you uh, to this lecture to mark the inauguration of the Institute. So let me begin by expressing our gratitude to the Hero Foundation on ethics and education, whose generosity will allow us and our successors to seek solutions to the problems facing humanity uh, and our planet. One uh, important aspect of our mission is public engagement. And I was therefore delighted when Nigel Warburton, leading public philosophers, accepted our invitation to present. He's the author of several excellent books, two of which I quite genuinely always recommend to uh, people who are interested in philosophy, along with Descartes' Meditations and Plato's Early Dialogues. And that's completely true. And um, yeah, just make the check payable to Roger Chris. Um, Nigel will speak for around 40 minutes, after which we'll have a little time for questions before moving on to drinks at 6pm or just after 6pm. Those of you who are dining at Rubin tonight will need to know that the dinner there starts at seven, so we will have to leave by half past six or 25 to seven because we're going to have to go through Trinity Lodge to get there. I was hoping we could go through the back gate, but uh, it's a bit muddy, so we can't. I invite Nigel to present his lecture, Philosophers Do It From The Armchair and Other Myths. Thank you, that was an amazing introduction and um, it's the most impressive audience I've ever spoken in front of and I'm delighted to see so many familiar faces, so many great philosophers and I'm absolutely honoured to be giving this lecture, which I hope will trigger some of you to disagree with me and that's the point in a way. Um, and I think it's the point of a lot of philosophy. Obviously, some philosophers do it in armchairs and do it very well. Conceptual analysis is perhaps suited to that. But what I'm interested in is why we think of a philosopher as somehow isolated or why the general public often thinks of a philosopher as somebody sort of secluded away from other people. When for me, it's the most social of disciplines where you can't really do it without engaging with other people, whether sometimes dead, but often living, um, often very lively. And, and we, you know, we thrive on discussion, yet we, we have a picture of ourselves like this in this Rembrandt painting, which is um, in the Louvre, which is described as philosopher in meditation. This is obviously a philosopher. You can tell it's a philosopher. He's got a book. He's got a beard. He's, he's a white European male, um, quite elderly. And I don't know if you can make it out, but there's actually um, a woman... Uh, stoking the fire, looking after his bodily needs. And, and that is the traditional picture of a European philosopher. You have the, the, the woman looks after you and you get on with your profound thoughts and you don't really need much else. I mean, some of the details here that might make it seem to be a philosopher is uh, more subtle perhaps. The um, spiral staircase could be an allusion to Diotima's ladder in, in the symposium, the idea that you move from the, the lustful thoughts of a uh, about a particularly beautiful person up that escalator to, until you get to the abstract world of pure ideas. Um, Post-Freudian uh, analysis might make that door a door to the cell of the unconscious, which is firmly locked. No irrational thoughts can emerge through for this philosopher quietly sitting there looking slightly sleepy. But he's not engaging with anybody else. He's, he's just getting on with his profound meditation. Obviously, the um, experimental philosophy movement took a burning armchair as their symbol because they thought that um, philosophy ought to be more empirical in many ways, that if we have intuitions about things, we ought to actually see if our intuitions are as universal as we tend to assume as philosophers. That's not the attack I want to make here. It's really about, I want to get rid of, rid of the idea that philosophy is best done in an armchair in seclusion. And my other attack points are on the idea that moral philosophers are experts. The other myths I want to dismiss, if we have time. 
very important point that um, more isn't better with philosophy necessarily. We often neglect that. More controversially, the myth that's more prevalent in universities and outside that public philosophy isn't the real thing. And the challenge that is a real challenge uh, about the impact of philosophy in the world is like, does it really change anything? So on with the first topic, the, the kind of alleged isolation of philosophers. I want to come at this through John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor. I mean, he does say that Harriet Taylor was a major um, contributor to On Liberty. What John Stuart Mill says in the second chapter on liberty about the nature of um, free expression actually applies very well to philosophy. It characterizes for me what is important about philosophy, that what, what's lost in that image of the, the, the solitary figure in the armchair. Mill says there's the greatest difference between, between presuming and an opinion to be true because with every opportunity for contesting it, it has not been refuted and assuming its truth for the purpose of not permitting its refutation. For him, there is a huge difference between dead dogma and living truth. I mean, truth, we can, we can be skeptical about truth. We could say living um, plausible belief, perhaps. But, but what we don't want to be doing with philosophy is perpetuating dead dogma, producing dead dogma. So what does he mean by dead dogma? Dogma is a, an unchallenged view, a view that hasn't survived any kind of criticism. It's a kind of cognitive rigidity that is, should, and what well, should be anathema for philosophy. It isn't always. Uh, I mean, one of the themes of my talk is what we need is not just more philosophy, but more good philosophy. So for me, a good philosopher is somebody who isn't cognitively rigid, isn't stuck with an unchallenged belief, but is constantly alive to the possibility that they might be wrong. The great Socratic tradition of, of finding others with whom we disagree and perhaps realizing that our views may not be as um, well-grounded as we thought they were. So what we want is philosophical opinions that are fully, frequently, and fearlessly discussed. And that, to me, is what's wonderful about philosophy. It's so often lost that we don't just stand on a soapbox like I am and tell you stuff. We are out there debating. We're out there looking for the best critique of our own position. And we don't sell that hard enough. That image of a philosopher cogitating is not what the, es the essence of the subject is. Sometimes it's a bit more pugilistic. Um, Wittgenstein, as David Edmonds and John Eidenow showed, <laughs> wasn't always um, uh, civil in the way he disagreed with people. I mean, this famously raised a poker to Karl Popper in a, at a meeting of the Moral Sciences Club. And if you want to find out about that, I strongly recommend David's brilliant book, uh, or the, David and, and John Eidenow's brilliant book, Wittgenstein's Poker. Civility is really important. Civility is um, at the core of what good philosophy is as well, I think. It's not about ad hominem arguments, it's not about putting people down, it's not about being good at debating at school and winning every argument, it's about pursuing the truth through a kind of um, cumulative um, and positive interaction with other thinkers, and not just other thinkers who more or less agree with us. And the danger that philosophers also are at risk from is that we don't seek out strong opponents of our views. John Stuart Mill was really keen that not only that we play devil's advocate to our own views, but that we seek out people who sincerely hold different views. And I think sometimes philosophers fall down on that, that it's very easy within a, an academic context, particularly if you're within a university that's followed the kind of characteristic philosophy hiring process of you get a cluster of people who are a bit like each other, and then whenever you appoint a new one, it's obvious that the best person for the post is a bit like you, only younger. Um, you, you end up with little um, cosy coteries of people with a certain sort of view. For Mill, the, the ideal situation was that you find somebody who strongly disagrees with you, and if you can't defend your position against that person, um, you're not holding your position as a living truth, and you, maybe you need to revise your opinion. 
So we need full, frequent, and fearless discussion. That is what we should be selling as philosophers. That's the myth that we want to dispel, that we're just sitting there agreeing with each other, nodding. No, we want full, fearless, full, full frequent, and fearless discussion. And to do that well requires a very extensive freedom of expression, because otherwise you're not going to get the full range of criticisms. And that's something which universities sometimes recognize and sometimes don't. Sadly, um, I can think of at least two cases in my lifetime, both of, uh, Roger, Roger Scruton and, and Kathleen Stock, where people with what might be considered extreme views by some members of the university basically hounded them out of jobs. Um, and those uh, critical positions were lost within the academy. You don't have to agree with everybody who is your colleague. In fact, if you do, you're probably in the wrong place if you want to be a, a true philosopher, in my view. And it, it, there's, a, there's a serious risk in university life that that gets ignored, that philosophy thrives on disagreement, civil disagreement, but strongly held views, sincerely held views that uh, come into collision with one another. And as long as people are in um, an honest pursuit of the truth or something better than the, the received opinion, I think that works very well, much better than, than um, uh, a set of nodding colleagues. Nodding in the sense of not nodding off. But... When I was um, doing my PhD, I was often asked, I did my, in the end I did my PhD on the philosophy of photographic representation. And some of my colleagues said, well, is that really philosophy? And got very worried about demarcation of the subject. At what point is this philosophy, or what point does it become art criticism or, or social commentary on the nature of the ways people use photography? Uh, I didn't really worry about that too much. I think that historically philosophy has always been an interdisciplinary subject and thrives on it, interdisciplinarity and that is a, a huge risk when it becomes isolated from other subjects. Daniel Dennett famously um, networked with a huge range of uh, neuroscientists, computer scientists and others um, and actually used that network of connections to hack into the latest understanding of, um, sorry, of, of, of the nature of the mind. I mean, he wasn't isolating himself. He was actually, through conversation with colleagues, getting shortcuts to finding what was going on, what the cutting edge science was. And that, I think, was hugely beneficial to his philosophy. When, um, when I interviewed Patricia Churchland, um, I can't remember what the topic was, but she made some aside in Philosophy of Bites about, about how she detests Oxford philosophers who sit in an armchair and pull their ideas out of their ass, which is um, not true, of course, but it's, uh, there, can, there have been in the past some people who do that. Peter Godfrey Smith is really interesting in this, in this context. He's showing philosophers another way of doing the subject. I don't know if you know about Peter Godfrey Smith, probably you all know him, but he's the guy who does philosophy in a wetsuit, basically. He, he dives on reefs in Australia and looks at um, what he sees there, whether they're octopuses in particular, but he's also interested in shrimp, in coral, in all kinds of other aquatic wildlife. Not just species, but actually individuals. He'll return and try and see the same octopus, try to understand the octopus, try to understand how it's negotiating its environment, how different its mind is from, from his, how, how complex the kind of interactions it's capable of, the learning, the apparent intelligence, and so on. And through that rich kind of phenomenological experience almost of, of an interaction with a, a very different kind of animal, he's developed a very rich understanding of consciousness, which combined with evolution and talking to evolutionary biologists has produced, I think, a, a, an amazing body of work in his three books. Um, do we have an equivalent in practical ethics? What is it that we need to connect with if we want to do good practical ethics? That's a kind of challenge. I don't know that it's an easy answer, but it does involve talking to people who've lived through Extreme experiences, I think. It, it involves talking to people who've not just theorizing about the nature of war, but talking to people who've experienced in different ways, not just um, speculating about what might happen with AI, but finding out what actually is happening and how it's perceived by a range of different users and victims of AI. Um, 
if you're trying to understand biomedical ethics, what do you do? You don't, you don't just have an idea of, of what's possible. You find out what the latest genomic uh, discovery is or whatever and see what the, the processes that are being put forward seriously as, as, as treatments or um, ways of um, using medicine. So how could philosophy be separate? How could it be done in an armchair separate? How could practical ethics be done separately from the rest of the world? It's absurd to think of philosophers in ivory towers just getting on with it. No, they should be out there talking to everybody who's relevant to the subject. Because what surely we want to do is give the best understanding we possibly can of the topic we're discussing. Because this is a serious issue. We're discussing how we should live. It's not a trivial is issue. And we only have a lifetime to do that, each of us, and we have to make some choices within that lifetime for ourselves on incomplete evidence, um, uh, varying degrees of certainty about the, the positions we adopt. And I think as philosophers, we should be flexible, ready to change as the world changes and, and uh, as, as um, different views are put forward. And so really, this is just a kind of tirade against that idea that philosophers are separate from the rest of um, society. They're, even if they're in armchairs talking to one another, that's wrong as well. They're, we're talking to everybody. We should be talking to everybody who's got a relevant interest in the topics that matter to us. Otherwise, we're not really doing our job. So what happens when you do that? Are, are you an expert then as a moral philosopher? Some people do portray themselves as experts and offer themselves to committees and, and to give medical advice and so on. Hi, I'm a philosopher. I could help you with that, that decision. To me, that always seems a little bit arrogant. Um, the idea that I know I'm a kind of philosopher king, or, um, and maybe you're a philosopher queen, and you have access to the, um, the nature of the forms. You know what um, the true good is, what the real, the real meaning of goodness, the real, re the real meaning of right or wrong, and you'll just tell people what that is. I think that's a very dangerous view of what a moral philosopher can do in society. And, and that's another myth I'd hope we get beyond. Maybe there are people here who want to defend that myth that you know more about things than ordinary people do, people who are involved in, in making their own decisions. It's interesting to know what you might substitute for that. Um, if I tell you how to live because I'm a moral philosopher, there is a problem that moral philosophers don't agree about how to live. So it just depends which moral philosopher you happen to encounter at the time um, as, as to which truth you're going to hear about that. So that's another myth I think we should get rid of. I believe that the expertise of a moral philosopher is expertise in moral reasoning. There's a sense in which they know a lot of the moves. They've got vocabulary for a lot of the positions. They can see how things will unfold if you go down certain directions. They look for consistencies, inconsistencies, parallel cases, use thought experiments to amplify our understanding of, of what the problems might be. It's not that they know the answers. Um, there's a kind of expertise that, that you might call wisdom as well, a kind of cumulative accumulated wisdom of having seen that sort of situation before in argument. The mysterious thing that nobody's quite explained to me that if you go and do a PhD somewhere like Oxford, you hang around with um, lots of clever people, you work on a very specialist topic, and then three or four years later you emerge able to see what matters when you get into a philosophical discussion. It's not something that's formally taught, but you've hung around with people who can do it. You've somehow picked up a sense of um, where it's best to pursue an argument where it might be fruitless. And I think the best philosophers that I've seen have this uncanny knack of knowing what the right question to ask is, as I'm sure you'll demonstrate later. Um, they also, I believe, the best of them, have expertise in expressing complex ideas clearly. And that's something I want to come back to um, with another myth that I'm going to hopefully dispel. But it's not the expertise of one who knows what the right thing to do is, and it certainly isn't the expertise of being an exemplar of good morality. <laughs> As um, Eric Schmitzgabel has shown, moral philosophers are amongst the, um, the worst when it comes to um, looking at, uh, at their own personal morality. We're not looking for a saint. We're not looking for an exemplar. We're looking for somebody who can pinpoint what the right questions to ask are and what the, 
what moral reasoning can show us. And how, I, haven't, I haven't mentioned this. Obviously, we're drawing on 2,500 years of Western philosophy to do this. We're not just starting from scratch. We're on the shoulders of giants there. Related to this is, is the strange idea that, I don't know why philosophers playing along with it, play along with this, that getting one philosopher on a committee um, works because it just depends which philosophy you put there. Um, it seems absurd to me to think that putting one philosopher on a committee is going to do the job because it could be Ayn Rand or it could be John Rawls and, and you're going to get very different answers for any moral issue that arises um, for that committee depending on who you have there. Obviously, as um, good philosophers, we can entertain ideas that we don't actually hold. But I'm with Mill in thinking, if you can get sincerity where people genuinely hold the beliefs that they're defending, that's a better position. You get them in a stronger form. You get them with a certain kind of seriousness, which you don't when you say, well, of course, a, a virtue ethicist might say this, but I'm not a virtue ethicist. No, get Rosalind Hursthouse on your committee and see what she says. I believe as well that philosophy flourishes when there's a diversity of viewpoints. I've already mentioned this, but we don't need a cozy coterie of consequentialists or a colloquium of Kantians. We need them mixed in together. We need um, a range of philosophers. We need diversity. I've already mentioned the kind of white European male um, assumption that um, many people make about philosophy. And I think things are changing, but we're still they're, they're changing in relation to the balance of the sexes in philosophy, but I don't think they've changed enough in terms of other kinds of diversity within, within philosophy. And that's something that we need to be very conscious of. All this seems to imply that it's a good thing to have more philosophers. More, more philosophy would make the world better. I disagree strongly with that. What we need is more good philosophy. That's easily missed. I've heard people go on the radio and say, well, isn't it wonderful we have philosophy in schools these days? Does anybody ever look at what they teach? For when, I mean, I, I have actually taught A-level philosophy. I've visited quite a few schools and there's some brilliant um, sick formers doing A-level philosophy. But for the most part, philosophy in schools has to work within an A-level framework which basically teaches people to second guess the marking scheme. We're not teaching the skills that we value as philosophers. We're teaching pragmatic skills about how to get a good grade in an exam system, which is quite unimaginative. Um, I don't think university philosophers have been engaged enough with that because they get products of that system, as it were, coming to do philosophy and being surprised often by what's expected of them when they, when they come into a university system, where in the best universities, of course, like Oxford, there's, there's a degree of um, teaching by conversation, teaching by discussion, uh, getting people flexible enough to argue from different positions, argue, not just learn received opinions that they can parrot. Um, but in some universities, it's true that that system of teaching isn't so different from the A-level teaching where people are looking for a certain kind of answer, which I don't think is the kind of philosophy that is good for, the, for society. I don't, what we need is people who think for themselves, who have good reasoning tools, can express themselves clearly, and it doesn't seem to me obvious that getting people to power arguments is, is the way to, to achieve that. There's also a sad truth about philosophy that isn't recognized sufficiently, that mediocrity is of little value, particularly in research. Why do so many people waste their life doing mediocre research in philosophy? It's a mystery to me. Um, you can come back at me on that. More philosophy isn't better necessarily. Nazis had plenty of philosophers that were defending various kinds of eugenics. Um, you can have excellent logical reasoning from false premises, and that can be disastrous too. You can have a very skilled calculator of consequences who just doesn't engage enough with the world to begin from, from true premises or premises which are likely to be true. So we should get away from the idea that more is better. We should concentrate more on quality. And Oxford is so well placed to emphasize that and, and, and to be a model of clear thinking and good, good use of reasoning. 
in a, in a variety of ways. Not that this should be a school of um, uhiro philosophers who always say the same thing, same kind of thing, but there are many ways you can demonstrate clear thinking and, and, and um, a desire to begin from plausible premises. They're informed by the latest science, the latest social science, history, or whatever the relevant discipline is. So for me, good philosophy um, is, amongst other things, built on plausible premises that are informed by the best available information about the topic you're discussing. It's living thought, not dead dogma. That's very important, and the willingness to engage with people who disagree with you. We test ideas to destruction and are sometimes criticised for this, but I think that's one of the ways that the um, philosophers show their philosophers are not dogmatists, that they push the argument to its limits, that they, they want the strongest criticism, they want to show that their arguments are not destroyed by their critics. The, an extreme case would be um, Derek Parfit's willingness to engage with um, his critics to seek out commentary over and over again on different drafts of his work. Uh, that was quite remarkable. I mean, most philosophers don't have the energy to, to do that or, or the brain power, but they can do it in different ways. He did it before he published. I think there's a um, kind of defensiveness, fear of the peer, I would call it, um, about putting out ideas that aren't fully defended, um, that aren't fully kind of ring-fenced from criticism, whereas sometimes, particularly in the area of practical ethics, publishing something which is stimulating to other philosophers serves the community of philosophers very well, even if it isn't perfect. In music, if you play the right note but at the wrong time, it's the wrong note still. And I think there's a sense of that with practical ethics that some moments pass. Um, and philosophers using traditional publishing methods often have quite a long delay anyway, but have been, you know, they're reluctant to comment on things that are of the moment the, where they could um, increase the level of debate. I think there's a real sense in which public debate about war, for instance, where, you know, things that have been happening today isn't at a high level in, in the media. There are, there are things that philosophers in this room could contribute that would take that um, debate to a much higher place and would be very fruitful and hopefully move us in the direction of a peaceful world and not a, a warlike one. But the system within universities doesn't make it easy for people to do that. And the reluctance of so many people to make fools of themselves is, is dangerous, I would say. That, that um, in Silicon Valley, people are happy to fail they actually think it's a good thing to fail because you do something better as a result. But in philosophy, so many people, you know, I might, I might make a fool of myself. Maybe I'm making a fool of myself now, but I don't care. I think if, it's, if, I get, if I make you think and you come back at me and you say something interesting, that is contributing to the subject. Sincerity is undervalued in philosophy. I think it does matter. I've mentioned it several times. In moral philosophy, I find it really irritating when people don't seem to believe what they say. And the general public, when we get into public philosophy, are excellent at detecting insincerity. And you lose a lot of epistemic credibility if you come across as a kind of renter mouth who just adopts a position for the sake of getting on to, onto the media. Lastly, I think it's really important that philosophy should be clearly expressed. Obviously, through the history of philosophy, that's not always been the case. Um, I don't think we have any excuses for poorly expressed ideas, particularly in the area of practical ethics. More than that, I actually think it's a moral failing. First of all, you're not taking part in the conversation if, you, if people can, aren't, can't understand what you're saying. You're forcing them to do work, which they didn't have to do. It makes critical engagement with their ideas difficult, so you can't have that sense of um, uh, living truth, truth that's being challenged and defended, it wastes time and time short and expensive for some people, but um, time is valuable. Frequently it masks very shallow thought. Uh, people who can't, in, with, I, I make Philosophy Bites a podcast with David Edmonds here. Um, 
Most of the philosophers we interview are capable of expressing quite complex ideas very clearly. You just have to ask the right questions. Some people occasionally, and we have edited a few out, um, don't do that. I won't name names. Um, and some people collapse when you ask them a question, which is quite surprising. If you think that's a philosopher, what, are you really a philosopher? All I did was present a counter-argument. Why didn't you stop and think about how you would accommodate that? They're not expecting to take part in a, in a discussion, particularly when they've not been clear about what they meant. The risk of, of obscurantism often is that you, it turns the thinker into a guru where people have to just follow them and interpret their words, which is the opposite of a philosopher, I think. The, 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 the dead dogmatist is not a philosopher in my view. So commit that stuff to the flames. When there's more, more of it and it's bad, um, this is bad for everyone. We don't want sloppy philosophical arguments dominating the mainstream. We don't want the public to think of philosophers as bullshit merchants. That's not, what, that's not good for anybody. Such a lot to contribute to the world. Um, and again, Uhiro Institute is so well placed to model clarity of thought, clarity of expression, um, civility in discussion, all the things that a part of good philosophy. And as I've already mentioned, if philosophy in schools becomes a matter of anticipating marking schemes, you're falling back on something which I thought had been undermined, at least in the 60s, the idea that Paolo Ferreira um, made clear that people aren't empty vessels to fill with facts. That's not what education is about. Um, you don't want the banking concept of education where you you fill a student with stuff and just take stuff out when you want the to you need some ideas back from them. That's not what philosophical education. We need to educate people about what philosophy can be and how important it is to um, engage with ideas, to start defending our own thoughts, and and to make your reasoning clear so that other people can engage with you. There is a very positive side to this, though. Um, Organisations like, such as the Philosophy Foundation and SAPARE, the, the, the P, P4, uh, what's it called, P4C, the, the, the movements that go into primary schools and encourage children to discuss often operate at a higher level than some of the, teach, than some of the teaching that goes on in sixth forms in, in, in schools. So there is hope. Um, people don't say this to my face, but I feel that some people think that doing public philosophy isn't the real thing. The real thing is publishing in peer-reviewed journals, which I have done. Um, and not many people read what I did. Um, I didn't make much impact. Um, and then I was told by a colleague, after Philosophy Bites had had, I don't know, five million downloads or something, you're not making impact in the technical sense, at which point I thought I was in the wrong place in the university system. Um, I think philosophical conversation is, is a legitimate part of, part of philosophy. I think communicating clearly with a, a wide public is part of philosophy. I think many of the people who think they're cutting edge are actually repeating arguments that other people have made in slightly different words, making finer and finer distinctions in the journals. And as philosophers reflecting on how we should live, do they really believe that's the best way to live? Do they really, are they going to say on their deathbeds, oh, I wish I'd published a few more peer-reviewed articles. Um, I doubt it. Um, also, look at the great philosophers, some of them in the room, who do public philosophy. That's a, um, throughout the history of philosophy, philosophers have been communicating clearly in a popular way with people who aren't professional philosophers. Professional philosophy is a relatively new product anyway. Um, but all these people, have done what I would say is public philosophy in a, a very powerful way. And they're eminent thinkers, they have done it well, and um, it's nothing to be ashamed of. What's more, the world is actually hungry for philosophy, and I don't think, I doubt if you realize this. Um, it's quite awe inspiring if you put public philosophy out there, just what the response can be. But there are risks because if, if good philosophers don't put stuff out there, people will feed from Jordan Peterson or whoever. 
um, there's plenty of bad philosophy, bad thinking that people can, can get fat on. Um, so just to give an example, you know, within traditional public philosophy, you, you go on the radio, you go on TV, you publish trade books, you have a column in a newspaper, as I, I do, several people in the room do. Um, you'd give public lectures, you talk to the public. That's a tr traditional public philosophy. But it's been amplified massively by the digital revolution. So you can do this stuff, but in the past, um, Bernard Williams would go on the radio, and then it would be a matter of chance whether somebody had the radio turned on at that point or not. But now I can listen to some of Bernard Williams' talks. I can, somebody's put um, material from the Open University Archive, which has um, Bernard Williams, amongst other people, speaking for Open University students. These things can be re-accessed. There, there are things that are changing dramatically. But even within traditional media, the reach of philosophy can be huge. Um, my PhD supervisor, Hugh Meller, told me, um, don't waste your time writing philosophy books that don't sell well. You're not, you're not going to get much of a readership. Uh, well, A Little History of Philosophy has been translated into 28 languages at least. Um, and I tweeted something the other day about, there was a picture of um, Spinoza in a bakery shop window in Istanbul. And um, the, tweet, the person who tweeted this uh, said that this, this baker was giving away free cookies free sweet, sweet um, cakes on Spinoza's birthday. And I just tweeted, oh, I can see why. I'm beginning to see why um, my books are bestsellers in Turkey now. And I had 3.5 million views of that tweet, which I usually get 1,000 or 2,000, and 44,000 likes, and tw mostly from Turkey, um, 22 I think 22,000, no, no, 200 comments, and people say, oh, we love you in Turkey, we read your books. And it's quite stunning that it doesn't take that much to reach a huge audience, and it's amplified again by social media. Um, oddly, in Turkey, it seems to be Instagram, which is the medium most used. Um, and I was surprised, because I wouldn't have, I naively, I wouldn't have thought Turkey would be a place which would seek out philosophy in that way, but that's my naivety, because it has a great secular tradition and um, a real, obviously, it's the birthplace of philosophy as much as Greece is as well. But the problem with traditional media, like television, like trade book publishing, like radio, is that there are gatekeepers. And these gatekeepers usually have a fixed idea about format, about what the public will like, about why you need to do biography rather than engage with ideas, um, why we can't possibly have somebody just sitting in a chair talking to somebody like Brian McGee did because that's old TV, it's not really what happens anymore. Um, and this is the problem for philosophy. I think um, my experience with Philosophy Bites, which I'm, um, I keep plugging, is um, that there's a huge audience for straight in the um, un unornamented style of philosophy where people are just discussing ideas. There is a real thirst for this worldwide. Um, and the digital revolution has produced a plethora of ways in which we can reach people. It's not just podcasts. Podcasts is just one medium where, bring, which bring the voice back into philosophy, which I think is incredibly important. Um, websites, blogs, stacks, ebooks, all kinds of things. Online magazines, I work as a commissioning editor for E.ON, which several of you have published within. Uh, a magazine that prides itself on, on having serious thinkers communicating to a broader audience in an intelligible way, but without oversimplifying their ideas. And there are many such websites, um, Lots of ways in which the new media can do things. But for me, the, the, the most amazing thing about the new media is that it puts the power in the philosopher's hands. You don't have to kowtow to producers and directors. So we've had 48, over 48 million downloads. Dave's a producer and director. Um, we, didn't, we don't have to limit what we do. We, we decide how long our programs are, who we're going to interview. It's up to us. 
And you can all do that if you want to. Um, with a, an iPhone, you have an incredibly powerful microphone and recording device that you can make recording level, broadcast level quality audio. You can make amazing video. You've all learned how to communicate and use Zoom and so on through the pandemic. And, and actually, this is a, a remarkable time for philosophy and that we can, we can seize the tools of production, as it were, and, and, and bypass those well-meaning but often mis misguided um, gatekeepers who stop us reaching the public, who want this. They really want this. People all over the world want to talk about how we should live. It's not a, um, a niche sport, as it were. Lastly, I want to um, briefly talk about the idea that philosophy doesn't change anything. It's just words. Well, that's easily refuted. Here's one counterexample that we all know about, Peter Singer. Who says it's just words with Peter Singer? He's actually, this is him just about to receive a million dollars from, from the Gruen, the Begruen Prize, and he's literally walking on water uh, by a shallow pond in a, in a suit that he borrowed consistently from his brother because he didn't want to waste money on buying a a DJ, he didn't have a DJ. And um, he gave that million dollars straight away to charitable causes. Peter Singer had a huge influence on the world. He influences how people eat, what people eat, the welfare of animals, how money is distributed across the world. You couldn't say that his philosophy has left everything as it is. It, whether you agree with him, whether you think that um, he pushes things too far, I mean, it, he Maybe some of, some of the arguments he uses in other areas of, of ethics start to become dangerous ideas, but he certainly changed things. But often moral philosophy doesn't succeed in changing things and can be seen as an epiphenomenon. He's a remarkable case. There are other cases, and actually a lot of them are in the area of, of how we treat animals. I was thinking Jonathan Birch has done some amazing work on animal sentience, a classic example of... Um, how you can work with scientists in, in NFC, and, and he's influenced how we treat lobsters, whether you boil them alive or not. Um, and he thinks and argues very persuasively that although we can't be certain that lobsters feel pain, there's sufficient evidence to operate a precautionary principle and not boil them alive because they seem to feel pain. And, and there are more humane ways of killing lobsters. He's changed the world. But... Um, Think about um, a famous case of a moral philosopher ma making a public intervention um, in relation to something incredibly important, the um, dropping of atomic bombs on Japan. I mean, very relevant to the hero centre, given that the founder, um, donor, as it were, of the whole foundation was himself a victim of Horoshima and, and decided to move in the area of um, ethics and world peace as a direct result of that. So when Truman was put up for a, an honorary degree in 1956, I think I'm right in saying that Elizabeth Anscombe was the sole... No, I'm not right. He's shaking his head. Um, with Philippa Foot um, and, and um, Michael Foot were opposing um, Truman's degree on moral grounds. She argued that um, he was using killing innocent people in dropping those bombs, pushing the button, as it were. He was killing innocent people in order to achieve the end of ending the war. That something that certain kinds of consequentialists would say, well, the end justifies the means, that she questioned that. And although she might allow that some kinds of killing in war could be legitimate in the sense that she believed in a law of double effect, um, that um, you could have foreseeable deaths that weren't, un that weren't intended deaths. She didn't think that applied in this case. Um, in retrospect, and probably at the time, it looked as if she, were just, she was just rationalizing some fairly hardcore Catholic beliefs that she had. She was providing a kind of philosophical framework that just happened to, to come out with the same conclusion as, as the mainstream Catholic thinking promoted. 
Um, but she did lots of things. She, she expressed herself very clearly. It relates very closely to her um, philosophical positions on intention generally and seeing actions under particular descriptions. And she also made an important point about drawing the line, which has wider application, that just because you can't draw a line very precisely doesn't mean you can't recognise when something is way beyond the line. And those sorts of ideas have actually con continued to be discussed. They're obviously incredibly relevant to what's going on um, at the moment today as we speak in, in terms of war and what is and is not um, a proportionate response, whether killing that's foreseeable is as culpable as filling the, killing that's sought um, and done simply as an end in itself. And I would say that even something that is so riddled with um, what seems to be self-serving um, rationalization is a major contribution, contribution to debate because nobody else was saying those things in public. Nobody else was promoting that kind of discussion. And actually what she wrote about Mr. Truman's degree is not a very coherent philosophical tract, but she delivered it at the right time. It was not quite the right note, but it was a note in played at the right time because that's when Truman was being offered a degree. Um, and at the very least, um, even that kind of philosophy does change the world. She didn't stop Truman getting a degree. So in that sense, her desired outcome wasn't achieved. But I think we should celebrate when people change um, what we understand by um, when somebody delivers good moral philosophy and it is thought-provoking, provides a different conceptual framework, shows imagination and the possibility of seeing the world differently, we're moving in the right direction. It doesn't have to be perfect to be an important piece of moral philosophy. And so on that note, I, um, I want to open up um, to questions rather than comments from the floor. Thank you.